Details about the Garden of Eden that many don't know. Number 1. The Present-Day Location of the Garden The Bible has many mysteries that have continued to spike the interest of man. Among them is the location of the Garden of Eden. A lot of research has been conducted combining forensic findings and the scriptures in an attempt to discover this lost paradise. According to the Bible, the Garden of Eden was planned and planted by God Himself. It is where He placed Adam and Eve after He created them. The Garden is regarded as a stunning location with abundant fruit trees, lush foliage, and running rivers. In Eden, there was no pain or death since Adam and Eve coexisted peacefully with God and the natural world. There is perfect harmony between God, nature, and man. The term Eden is a Hebrew word that translates to pleasure or delight. This means that Adam and Eve lived in complete pleasure in this garden. However, after breaking God's prohibition against eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve were driven from paradise, and cherubim and a flaming sword sealed it off. From that point on, people had to work extremely hard to support themselves and encountered several hardships and difficulties. The question we can't help but ask ourselves is where this Eden is located today. The Bible says this concerning the garden. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Genesis 2, 8, 10 to 14. Interpreters have approached these physical descriptions in two ways. The first approach starts with the Tigris and Euphrates River of today. In this interpretation, these rivers continue to go by their old names and, for the most part, travel the same path from Turkey's mountain range into modern-day Iraq, before emptying into the Persian Gulf. According to this approach, the location of the Garden of Eden is thought to be in the now-flooded northern region of the Persian Gulf. The Bible says that a river watering the garden flowed from Eden, from there it was separated into four headwaters. This indicates that four rivers merged to become one, which then flowed through the gulf after draining into the garden. According to this interpretation, the Gion is identified as the Dez and Quran rivers, which flow across western Iran and still join the Tigris and Euphrates. Genesis connects the Gion River to the land of Cush, which is associated with the Kassites in this interpretation. It additionally suggests that there may have been several places with the name Cush in ancient times, referring to Genesis 10 where the Bible states that Nimrod, son of Cush, ruled in Mesopotamia. A long dried up river was seen in 1994 satellite radar photos of northern Arabia, offering proof of a possibly dried up Pishon River. This river, Pishon, is mentioned in Genesis as being associated with the gold-rich Havala region. This dried up river originated in Western Arabia, maybe in Havala, and flowed east toward the Tigris and Euphrates, where it joined before draining into the Persian Gulf. Some Bible scholars and archaeologists suggest that Eden was somewhere in Africa, presumably in Ethiopia, Tanzania, or Botswana. The Pishon and Gihon rivers mentioned in the Bible as being in Eden are thought to be the Nile and the Blue Nile, both of which have their origins in Africa, adding credence to this theory. In Genesis 2.13, the Bible expressly states that the Gion River encompasses the land of Ethiopia, which adds to the credibility of this theory. The second interpretation similarly takes the text seriously but reads Genesis 2 in the context of the flood of Noah, Genesis 6-8. The region where the Garden of Eden once stood would no longer exist if the Bible is true and this flood was a worldwide occurrence. There is no accurate way to estimate how much the world's geography was changed by the flood and has continued to change to date. Are rivers, gulfs, mountains, and canyons still the same as they were before the flood? It is a mystery. The only possible explanation for the continued existence of the Tigris and Euphrates is that the flood survivors, Noah, and his descendants, rebuilt and gave their new surroundings old places names that they were familiar with before the flood. The flood possibly destroyed all of the Earth's topography and Noah and his children only named the present-day Tigris and Euphrates rivers so because they were familiar with the names, not necessarily because those were the same rivers mentioned in the Garden of Eden. Many Bible scholars believe that we will never find the Garden of Eden, but this is God's divine knowledge to keep. There were two special trees in the garden. 
The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what most of us recall when we think about the Garden of Eden. But there was another significant tree, the tree of life. This tree grew in the middle of the garden and it was accessible from all directions of the garden. We mostly remember the tree of knowledge of evil because Adam and Eve were banished from the garden after eating the fruits of this tree and forget about the tree of life, which also holds a lot of significance in this story. The tree of life was right there, next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The only thing that is said about the tree is that God separated Adam and Eve from it before they touched it, after they both ate the forbidden fruit. Before Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, God made no mention of eating from this tree. God then said after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, Now, what if man also reaches out his hand to take fruit from the tree of life, and eats it and lives forever? The Lord God therefore banished him from the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 22-23 In fact, God is so careful that Adam and Eve don't return to the garden that he places cherubim and the flaming revolving sword to guard the road to the tree of life. Why would God, who in the first place hadn't forbidden the tree of life, suddenly take such great care to preserve it from people? The Bible says that if man had eaten of this tree, he would live forever. The result would have been to render sinners, and hence also sin, eternal. Imagine being eternally vulnerable to sin and the negative effects it brings. Adam and Eve actualized that potential by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All of the things that were formerly considered good now have the potential to be evil. Not everything is good now, in contrast to the early days of creation. Man now would be made subject to sin all his life, which is forever. To prevent this and out of concern for him, God hurriedly drives man out of the garden. A sin had been committed and a door opened for evil to enter and dominate the once all-perfect world. And the tree of life did not provide an immediate solution. Yes, it did offer a possible remedy, but it was too risky, the immortality of man. The possibility of bodily immortality is eliminated when God drives Adam and Eve out of the garden and away from the tree of life. This at first instance is seen as cruel of God, but in actuality, it was a saving act. Instead of letting Adam and Eve eat the fruit and subject all humanity to an everlasting life of sin and evil, God was compassionate to kick us out. Imagine getting eternal life, but having to live it in an imperfect world, living eternally with evil. In other words, the tree of life did not provide a simple solution to the chaos caused by the clash of good and evil. Before we could go back to Eden's purity, things had to be made right. Good and evil had to be handled within this fallen world. The tree of life did carry the answer, but not immediately. God never intended to permanently restrict it from us when he cut us off from it, only up until the appointed hour. In the final book of the Bible, the tree of life reappears. There, John receives a vision of the river of life-giving water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. On either side of the river grew the tree of life that produces fruit 12 times a year, once each month. The leaves of trees serve as medicine for the nations, Revelations 22, 1-3. Eden had been restored and is once more accessible. Its fruit is bountiful and readily available, owing to the Lamb, the crucified Lamb, whose throne generates the water necessary to sustain the tree of life. The cross of Christ, a tool of death, is now referred to as the tree of life. Christ's body and blood, its fruit, are food for everlasting life. Because of the tree of the cross, sin is forgiven, death is vanquished, and life is restored, making the triumph of the cross the exile from Eden turned around. Jesus' obedience undid Adam's disobedience enabling all of us to enter Eden once more. We, therefore, have hope of returning to the perfect Garden of Eden once more. It may not be the physical initial garden as God planted it, but it will be a state of perfection. There will be no more death, no more pain, and no more tears, because through his death on the cross, Christ has taken that burden off our shoulders. We occasionally grow weary of this world and become intensely yearning for the next, but a return to Eden is not all that we yearn for. Although Eden was lovely, it lacked security. As evil entered Eden, it brought destruction with it. The new creation, which will serve as our permanent home, will be totally secure. Anyone who acts in a repulsive or deceitful manner will never be allowed inside. There will be ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and country and nation living in this great beautiful city. We will live in this home with our ideal bridegroom as the bride of Christ. His voice won't simply be audible in the garden we will see his face as well. Here, we will live in eternal perfection.